Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing? Everyone good? A warm welcome to Barcelona and a warm welcome to the Smart City Expo. And an even bigger, warmer welcome here to the ICC Conference and the Mayor Forum. My name is Maeve McMahon. I'm a journalist based in Brussels normally, working for Euronews, but I'm delighted to be with you here physically for the next two days for this ICC conference, which brings together ICC cities, mayors, deputy mayors, experts and advisors to take stock of the progress made so far during the ICC initiative and also to discuss, of course, the challenges of those green and digital transitions. Now, very shortly, we'll be hearing from the European Commission DG Gros Valentini Superti, and we'll also be hearing from the deputy mayor of Barcelona, that's Laia Bonet. But first, a couple of annou announcements for you that will be coming up here as well on your screen. We can just go back to the previous slide there. Just so you're all aware that this is being live streamed. So hello to those who are joining us online today. You're more than welcome to get involved by using the hashtag, which is Intelligent Cities Challenge. All these recordings and presentations will be available and shared after this event. So you can also catch up on them and share them with people back home in your city. And on Thursday, when you're back home, you'll be receiving an email. You'll be asked for some feedback about this very event. So do fill that out, that survey, so that these events can always get better. And also, we're really excited that this is physical, because after so many years of Zooming, we're capturing the moment today by having a photographer here with us physically in the room. I'm excited about that. I don't mind having my photo taken, but if there's anyone here who doesn't want to be on camera, who doesn't want to have their photograph taken, just go outside, make the info desk aware, and you'll receive a little sticker so that the photographer won't capture you. So now just to really the highlights of this forum, why we're here. We're here, of course, to catch up, to network, and to exchange ideas. We're also here to showcase political leadership when it comes to cities transitioning towards those green and digital paths. Through local green deals, of course, we're reassessing political priorities in light of the current challenges facing Europe and facing our cities. We can just go to the next slide so you can have it there as well. This event as well, as I said, is about zooming in on the progress made so far during the ICC initiative and paving the way, of course, for the next phase of ICC and reinforcing collaborative governance at local level. This is, of course, about getting everyone involved. And to do all this, you can move along now, skip the next slide and just bring up the agenda there so I can tell you what we have in store for you all. It's pretty action packed. We've lots coming up for you. If you just go on to the next slide, thank you so much. We'll have lots of coffee breaks, by the way, because we want to make sure that you have enough time to chat among yourselves and get to know new people. And after the intros, we'll be having a keynote speech from one of the most influential designers in the world, Professor Carlo Ratti who's here with us today in the room. Then we'll be meeting some mayors. They'll be coming up here on stage with me. We'll be having a Q&A. And then after the coffee break, we'll be, you'll be splitting into smaller groups there to have your say. And that will be off the record. There'll be no cameras on then, so you can really give your feedback to this event. And then later this afternoon, we'll have a family photo. So you'll all be invited up here on stage and we'll have your photo taken. Then there'll be some more networking outside. And there's dinner for those in the room who are elected officials, elected politicians. The city of Barcelona is inviting you for dinner. You should have received the email. If you didn't and you need some more logistical information, just ask outside there at the info desk. And just very finally, we can go to the next slide. Thank you so much, because this is, of course, about local green deals. This forum is all about them. Crucial local action plans that are hugely important, by the way, if the European Union is to reach the ambitious goals that they're putting on the table as we speak at COP27 over in Sharm el-Sheikh. These local green deals go beyond the action planning approach. They're about working together with local businesses, stakeholder organizations and civil society initiatives, getting everyone involved. Now, for the time being, I have spoken enough. I believe that you're all suitably informed about what the local green deal is, what is happening, what networking opportunities you have. So at this stage, I would like to invite up on stage now Valentina Superti. She's the Director of Tourism and Proximity from DG Grow from the European Commission. So Valentina Superti, the floor is yours. Thank you so much.
So, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, I think you hear me. You hear me, yes, good. So, dear uh, uh, mayors, deputy mayors, heads of regions, dear all of you, many project officers as well. I am uh, uh, particularly pleased to be with you here today, finally, finally, in a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting of these uh, intelligent uh, uh, cities, uh, mayors forum. And uh, thank you, thank you, first of all, for taking part in this event, which is important. So that's my first message. It's an important uh, uh, event. And why? Precisely for the reasons that were mentioned before, because I, 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 I and the European Commission believes that uh, engagement with cities and local authorities and your commitment, your commitment is key for bringing forward a European shared agenda, a European shared agenda. Uh, you know better than me, uh, the times uh, we are living are extremely uh, volatile. So we are living uh, definitely a, an environment uh, which is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And uh, uh, if we think of it, a second, uh, we are navigating uh, through a continuum of crises uh, since uh, uh, 2008. At the time it was the financial uh, crisis, and then we got, went uh, through the pandemic. Hopefully it's over. Then the Russia's uh, uh, aggression uh, of Ukraine, uh, with all the consequences, of course, uh, this is first of all, uh, we know, a human tragedy. But uh, uh, this situation brings uh, uh, high energy prices, as uh, we all know. Unfortunately, high inflation and very much a global disruption of uh, supply chains. And then, the last but not least, I would put into this context box uh, the effects of climate change. And I think that we have reached the level, I hope you agree with me, that we do not need any more reports or scientific analysis uh, uh, to tell us that uh, we have a situation here. So global warming is, uh, uh, is under our eyes of us all every day. So we must do something about it. So, but how, how, how can we envisage together a sustainable future for Europe, hopefully? Uh, for me, so my proposal to you is, is to say that a sustainable future is a reality where there is more environmental, certainly, but also social sustainability and all this coupled with an appropriate governance model. So all these three elements are important. As you know, the European Commission has committed to climate neutrality by 2050 with the European Green Deal, the 455 package. The European Commission has also put money uh, the, with the novel Next Generation EU package, I'm sure uh, uh, all of you uh, have heard about it. It's an important amount of funding which comes on top of the ordin ordinary European and national uh, funding possibilities. And importantly, this big amount of money has to be devoted to a major extent, more than half of it, to sustainability, digitalization, digitalization as a means to go more sustainable and resilient. So resilience is the third strand. And uh, more specifically for, uh, from DigiGrow, so I'm working in DG, I have the pleasure and honor to work in DigiGrow, which is the Director General in the, U in the European Commission dealing with industry, SMEs, and internal market. Uh, so, and we are responsible for the ICC, so for this initiative. Uh, we, what is that we want to do? We want to, to work uh, uh, relentlessly for a, having a European industry 
but also the many, many, many SMEs uh, that are operating in Europe. And eventually, I would hope our society to be a more sustainable again, more digitally enabled, more uh, a resilient society, which also means an, a society which is more independent from uh, uh, external sources, but at the same time, uh, to the extent possible, that is open to the world. And uh, uh, so we are also determined to continue working with our uh, strategic partners. And in DigiGrow, we are bringing forward a, a, a so-called industrial agenda, which is uh, basing itself on the identification of 14 industrial ecosystems. So, so we have identified the 14 industrial ecosystems in Europe. And uh, we are doing an endless number of initiatives. So perhaps I will, uh, perhaps uh, I am tempted to say perhaps even too many because <laughs> we have a communication challenge here. <laughs> but uh, uh, perhaps just to mention a couple, which uh, may be interesting uh, to know about. Uh, one is the, an upcoming uh, uh, raw materials initiative. So we are preparing a so-called Critical Raw Materials Act. What is this about? It's about uh, the Europe being more autonomous when, uh, uh, when having to, uh, to deal uh, with the critical uh, raw materials that, by the way, we know are essential for ensuring the transition. And it is, on the one hand, engaging, uh, continuing engaging with our partners. As you know, many of these critical raw materials has to be found outside Europe. But at the same time, it's about improving our way of dealing with cr critical raw materials in Europe, including uh, through circularity, so through having more uh, circular business models. Um, another uh, initiative I want to mention here, because I think this is interesting, uh, and I hope it's interesting and important for, uh, for cities in particular, uh, it's a very recently a proposal that we have done uh, concerning the short-term rental market. So this is, uh, you know, uh, commonly called the Airbnb, but uh, there is more to it than Airbnb. So the objective that we have uh, with this proposal is to help a sustainable development of tourism. And we want to give those uh, who are best placed to take decisions, uh, meaning uh, the local authorities, the cities, the means to deal with the social acceptance of tourism. Uh, how? It's a data-driven proposal. So we want to increase the transparency on the short-term rental market through a targeted transfers of data from those concerned by the market. So on the one hand, the hosts, those letting the apartments. Uh, on the one hand, the public authorities on the, on the other. And thirdly, so it's a triangular uh, uh, situation. And the third are the platforms. And on this proposal specifically, I would welcome, perhaps not now, perhaps not in these two days, but in the, in, the, in the weeks and months to come, your input, because we are now in the process of co-legislation. So the proposal has been made by the European Commission, but it is being discussed with the Parliament and the Council, and we can still improve it if needed. Then I want to mention a, another strand of work so, so that you know, but also because this fits with what we are doing uh, here today. Uh, and it's, um, it's about uh, transition pathways, uh, which is not a particularly, uh, how to say, sexy word or expression. But what does it mean? It means that uh, uh, for the 14 industrial ecosystems that we have identified, we are engaging to a dialogue with all those uh, who, are, uh, who have a say on, uh, on the specific industrial ecosystem with a view to identify concrete projects. So this is about walking the talk. It's uh, moving from strategy to action. We want to identify projects, uh, projects that go again in the direction because those are uh, uh, three key points, sustainability, digitalization, and uh, resilience. For example, yesterday, this may be of uh, direct interest to you, we released the social economy, social economy transition pathway, and uh, we are already working on the construction uh, um, ecosystem as well, and on tourism uh, in incidentally. 
So, uh, what's my point here, uh, uh, you know, with all these uh, descriptions, is also to say that uh, we need to find ways to make all these objectives realistic, to make them happen. And to make them, them happen, we need you, we need the cities, we need the local businesses very much, so cities alone uh, cannot do it. Uh, they, they, they need the businesses and the other organizations. So cities are, uh, are clearly at the heart of this transformation project. This is exactly the, the objective of the Intelligent Cities Challenge, to support a community of 136, so 136 European cities from 21 countries. So it's also a diverse uh, community. And you uh, and, uh, and the cities are there to deliver uh, on these commitments, on the, and specifically on the Green Deal commitments. So, of course, um, you are developing uh, local Green Deals. Uh, uh, these are uh, uh, local action plans uh, that, uh, um, uh, are, uh, that are developing on the ground. And by the way, I would already say now thank you for all of those uh, who are, uh, who are uh, working on those uh, Green Deals. From our part, uh, use, useful to know that we have developed a blueprint for local Green Deals uh, to inspire and also guide, if necessary, if necessary other cities in this same uh, um, process. And uh, uh, my figure here on my text says, uh, uh, so I have a four zero, 40 cities having been developing uh, local green deals to date. So that's not enough, but it's already good. So thank you for uh, that. And uh, of course, uh, this is also a call for uh, all the others uh, to engage. Uh, for your information, uh, uh, with these initiatives, uh, we also go outside Europe, so we are making the link with the global, uh, uh, with the global scene, and we are bringing forward the discussions in the context of the COP, uh, uh, I have here seven, but I think COP is 27 or seven, I don't, anyway, you know what I, uh, you know what I refer to, this is uh, also, you know, the context of the Sharm El Sheikh uh, uh, gathering, and we have a dedicated discussion on local green deals uh, precisely on 17th, uh, which is in, uh, in two days. So, uh, we need you, and we are here also to listen to you, because we need feedback. We are a little bit there uh, in a, I don't, like the expression ivory tower, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit the case. So we need you, we need to understand the realities on the ground against the background of shared objectives. So I hope uh, that we are uh, there. La uh, perhaps just let me say two things uh, to close. Let's, we are not forgetting, I'm sure you don't forget, <laughs> all of us, the people, the people. So we are working on skills, at the same time, because of course the uh, transition is uh, to, be, to be done, it's nice, it's a nice objective, but we, if we don't bring the people with, the, with it, uh, we may have a problem. So we are uh, working on Pact for Skills, by the way, 2023 is the European Year for Skills, and we are uh, working to promote massive upskilling and reskilling opportunities. So we may, um, so on the one hand, again, uh, we are interested to learn from you how you deal with the skills uh, aspect, uh, uh, but also we want to let you know what we are doing and hopefully we can help uh, uh, each other. Uh, and by the way, we want to, to work on local skills uh, partnerships as well, because for the moment uh, we are really mapping at the European level, which is quite high level, but we want to go local. Now, uh, I, I, I perhaps uh, would stop it here for, the, for a moment. Uh, I, I take uh, the opportunity, I hope uh, you, you understand me. Um, uh, on this one, so we are uh, very busy uh, for the moment uh, with uh, trying to support uh, uh, Ukrainians, uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians. And uh, specifically, uh, we are uh, uh, launching a call for helping Ukrainians uh, with uh, 
uh, devices, for example, take electric uh, to, to get for them to get electric heaters for the period that is to come, which is going to be awful, I think. Um, so um, I think uh, uh, perhaps, uh, yes, uh, some information is here, but we will let you have the links because uh, any help that you can also give us uh, from uh, your constituencies, from your cities, will be uh, most, most uh, uh, welcome and appreciated by us, but more importantly by the uh, Ukrainians. So thank you very much. Perhaps I let you now, uh, you, you know, there are all these um, discussions uh, that are upcoming, and then uh, we will uh, wrap it up uh, uh, later on. And uh, thank you very much for those having listened to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valentina Superti. As you said, uh, Valentina, you're not in your, quote, ivory cage tower today. You're with us here in the room. You'll be in listening mode all day. And you'll also be delivering the closing speech a little bit later today, wrapping up the conclusions of this afternoon. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you a little bit later. And as you mentioned there, Ukraine, more information will be sent around to you all as well on that initiative. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite now up on stage Laia Bonnet, that is, of course, the Vice Mayor of Barcelona, the host city of this event. Laia Bonnet, welcome. Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to Barcelona. Let me start by that. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all here in our beautiful city of Barcelona. Thank you also to the European Commission and the ICC team for trusting Barcelona to help you de deliver this Mayor's Forum. Uh, we are meeting at a very particular time. We all know that. Uh, on one hand, it is the first edition that effectively goes back to normal after the three last editions deeply shaped uh, by the pandemic. We all know by now that online meetings are good, are not so bad, um, but it's not the same as seeing each other, as uh, seeing each other in person, as having face-to-face -face conversations. What we have here these days is an opportunity to reconnect um, and, and, and uh, reconnect with the most humane side of city-to-city -city, uh, cooperation. It is in this context that I want to invite you all to work hard, obviously, to work very hard, but also to remember that not so long ago, these kind of events were memories of the past. So I would like to encourage you to also enjoy the city during these days, to enjoy being together uh, again. On, this other, uh, on the other hand, uh, however, um, we are facing unprecedented, unprecedented challenges. We've got a war going on uh, on uh, European soil, which is also a war on our European values of peace, democracy, rule of law, social welfare, shared prosperity, and many others. As a result of the Russian aggression on Ukraine, uh, we are also going through one of the worst economic crises since the end of World War II. We know what this means for cities and our fellow citizens. It means energy bills that can be paid, rising rents and other living costs. It means shops that are shut down. We know it's not be being easy and what uh, that we cities don't always feel very much support uh, by other administration in addressing the effects of the current crisis. So in this context, I also wanted to invite you to keep in mind that when we talk about local green deals, about the digital transformation, about resilience or net zero, net zero cities, what we are actually talking about is how to make life easier to our fellow citizens. In short, about how to make our cities more livable for current and for future generations. Now, I know that some of you might come to Barcelona looking for answers or at least some learning. Indeed, it's not coincidence that Barcelona is one of the mentor cities in the Intelligent Cities Challenge Program. 
we have merged our economic and sustainability agendas into the Barcelona Green Deal, which is aimed at reducing emissions while diversifying our economy and creating green quality jobs. And we are indeed striving for a green and digital reindustrialization of our city, building on public and private collaboration and on science and technology based uh, uh, partnerships. The agreement between the Spanish government and Cisco to set the company's first microchip design center in Barcelona is an example of that. Or the collaboration between the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and IBM to work together on quantum, for instance. Those are important milestones in our way of building a diversified and resilient economy. But if you need to take one thing from Barcelona with you, I probably encourage you to take our willingness to place social equity at the center every step of the way. That is what we are doing, for instance, on digital uh, policy by directing our efforts into digital inclusion programs so that digitalization uh, doesn't amplify uh, the social inequalities that we have already, or by introducing social equity conditions to what cars can get into our low emission zone based on income and employment status of drivers. In any case, I wish you a wonderful stay in Barcelona and a very, very productive, uh, productive discussions today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Laia Bonet there, the Vice Mayor of Barcelona, with some opening words for us here at the ICC Forum. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our keynote speech, and that is all about the important role of new urban models and technology to support the city's green and digital transition pathways. This speech, ladies and gentlemen, will be given by Professor Carlo Ratti, He's an architect and an engineer who teaches currently at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he directs the Sensible City Lab. And according to Wired, not me, Carlo Ratti is one of the 50 top people who will change the world. So we're feeling pretty privileged and happy to have him here with us today at the ICC conference and Mayor's Forum. So Carlo Ratti, you can come up here on stage and join us. Thank you so much. Take it away. Well, good. Um, thank you, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Great pleasure to be with, um, with all of you here today. Well, first of all, just a, a small thing. You know, it was mentioned interactions in physical space are back. We're all very happy to be back here in Barcelona. Uh, there's a paper we had just a few weeks ago really quantifying the magic that happens in, digital, in physical space. It doesn't happen really in, uh, in digital space. So I just want to share this. Uh, it's a recent paper in Nature Computational Science that was on, uh, uh, on the cover. But I think, you know, so let's all enjoy, you know, the interaction and the beauty of, uh, of serendipity in being together in the same uh, room today. But what I wanted to share with you was um, uh, something I wrote an, an op-ed about a few weeks ago. Um, that was titled, What Cities Can Learn from uh, Venture Capital. I did it with uh, Rob Maga, who's a colleague of mine uh, in uh, what, what we work together uh, at the World Economic Forum. And, um, and so I wanted to share some of what we were thinking about in this uh, piece with, uh, with you today. Uh, given that there's so many mayors and public officials in the, in the audience, uh, well, the first thing I want to say what not to do for urban innovation, number one, is don't try to bet on future predictions, on trying to say, you know, well, tomorrow's city is going to go in this direction or that direction. And, uh, and the key thing is that, you know, it's basically impossible to, uh, to, to pick the right direction. There's so much uncertainty, so much, um, you know, let me give you a few, a few examples here of a, how people 100 years ago thought that life would be in the year 2000. These are a few visions from the early 19th century. Um, where a bunch of artists try to imagine life 100 years later. And, you know, some things they, they got right. They saw mechanization in, in farming coming. They saw 
even Roomba, the little robot, cleaning our homes. But they also got many things wrong. They thought we would come to Barcelona with this, uh, and the police in the city would patrol Barcelona like, uh, like this. So the first point I'm saying is that something that Karl Popper, the great philosopher, make uh, very vividly in the myth of the framework, uh, which is the future is open, is not predetermined, and thus cannot be predicted except by accident. So somehow, you know, as a mayor, as a city official, don't try to bet on this direction, that direction, but try to create a rich innovation ecosystem that can help really see what is going to win today or tomorrow. The second thing I want to mention is, uh, and that's related to the project I will show in, uh, in a moment, is uh, I think cities should not follow best practices that much. And um, the, the reason I'm saying that is that usually best practice means you're looking at another city and what another city did 10, 20, 30 years before. They designed something, they implemented, it might have taken five or 10 years to implement, then they monitor it was successful. And what you do, well, you just replicate that, which is very safe, but basically you're locking the future into the past. You keep on perpetuating lessons from the past. And certainly time is not what we have when we think about some of the big challenges we are facing today, starting from, uh, from the climate uh, challenges. And, uh, and so the key thing is, uh, I think cities to learn more, as uh, in that little article I showed before in the op-ed uh, for Bloomberg, from venture capital, from the point of view, try new ideas, test them, get feedback from citizens, and then iterate, keep on iterating to let them evolve. Very similar to what happens with, uh, with venture capital. Um, that's what we try to do when we collaborate with cities. We, uh, our lab is at, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, on the main MIT campus, but we got a few satellite labs and a lot of collaborations with, uh, with cities, trying to see how we can use this in order to speed up innovation. And I want to share with you a couple of, um, of projects. Now, um, the first one, is a project that was done in Helsinki and um, was part of the energy challenge <clears throat> run by the previous mayor of Helsinki uh, a couple of years ago. The problem for the challenge was uh, as follows. Uh, Helsinki has a very good heating system in the city. It's based on district heating. As you know, district heating means you got a power plant and then with the water you get, hot water you get as a byproduct from power production, you use it to heat the city. Normally, that's very good, but in Helsinki, the power plants run on coal. And so the mayor decided to decommission the coal power plants by the end of the decade. It looks like it's even going to be 2025 or 2026 now. And so the question was, how can you heat the city in a sustainable way? Instead of looking at uh, best practices and lessons from the past, what the mayor did was take inspiration from what happens in the United States, for instance, with uh, the X Prize Foundation. As you might know, the X-Prize Foundation, they take uh, you know, difficult challenges. They put a prize in the United States, usually $10 million, and let people compete from all over the world to develop ideas to tackle those, uh, those issues. So the mayor did the same. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was uh, the beginning. Over 250 global teams participated to, to develop solutions, 10 finalists, and finally the winners. We were one of the winning teams with, um, with three others. When I say we, I want to say this was actually done with uh, our design office, um, the New York uh, uh, part of our design office. But also, when we look at urban problems, it's very important to collaborate in a very transdisciplinary way. So in this case, working with different engineers, TransSolar, great engineers uh, dealing with climate engineering, SBP, very lightweight uh, structures. One of the key things, if you want to be sustainable, is to use very little you know, physical matter. So TransSolar there specializing in very lightweight uh, uh, structures, but also big multinationals such as Danfoss, Schneider, or OP, or Squint Opera to help, you know, really engage a broader constituency uh, for the project. Here's a little video of the solution, then I'll tell you a bit more about it. We're excited to present to you the Hot Heart, an innovative solution to decarbonize Helsinki. Here is how we do it.
So um, <clears throat> today, you know, if you want to decarbonize the city, there's good news and, and bad news. Well, the good news is what you see here to the left. And the good news, if you look at that, is the changing cost uh, in uh, wind power prices over time. So today, around the planet, if you produce with uh, wind or sun, you know, if you, if you power wind or sun, is uh, usually the cheapest one you can produce. Uh, around the planet, you can get anything between 10 to $30 per megawatt hour produced with photovoltaics or produced with, uh, with wind farms. So that's great news, but the problem, as you see, is what you see to, to the right. The problem is sometimes you've got too much sun, sometimes, sometimes little sun, too much wind or little wind. So the intermittency of, uh, of renewables, as you all know, is the main issue. Well, you might say, great, but why don't we use batteries? Yes, you know, batteries are a solution, but remember that price, you know, I told you one megawatt hour will cost you 10 or $30 to produce, but batteries for one megawatt hour will cost you $200,000 today. And the price of batteries is not going down that fast. Battery requires so much raw materials, so much energy. So somehow actually that's, uh, that's not going down as fast uh, as uh, production. So in this case, you know, the idea you saw it in the video was, uh, well, we tried something, we proposed something that normally, you know, if you are an engineer, this would be a thermodynamic crime, which is taking power and turn it into heat. But in this case, you just need to heat the city in the end. So why not to turn it into heat a bit earlier and store it, not as a standard battery, but as a thermal battery, what you see there to, to the right. Now, it turns out when you run the math that actually storing in a thermal battery will not be $200,000 200,000 euros per megawatt hour, but simply calls it to 200. And then it makes sense, you know, it, everything works uh, from, a, uh, from a technical and economic point of view. Um, here you see the system you saw before, to the left you got all the different uh, ways to produce energy, and then you got the hot heart in the middle as a big thermal battery, and then you got the district heating to, to the right. You just plug in into the existing system without very minor modifications, so you just, you know, Look at the input is uh, to the left, you know, just to the, the, the central piece and then reuse everything on the right. And you're compatible, as you see down in the lower part, with different uh, energy mixes because things have changed so much since we won the competition with, uh, uh, you know, with what happened in Ukraine and the changing energy prices. The mix has changed already so much across Europe and uh, in Helsinki in particular that we don't know it will be in 2030. Again, no need to try to predict it, as I was saying at the beginning, but let's build resilient system able to be compatible with different uh, type of mixes. And then when we're doing this, we said, well, we got this incredible archipelago, you know, small archipelago next to Helsinki, what can we do with it? And so that's how we came up with the idea on the right to create also a place to, to bring people there, to share this with people. You know, one thing is sure about the climate uh, challenges is that the only way we can get out of this is if we do it all together. And so instead of doing infrastructure, yes, you know, they can decarbonize, but it's not visible, why do we make it visible? Turn the islands into a place where people can go, citizens can enjoy, can learn about energy, decarbonization, climate change. So somehow it's a, it's a public space Philippe, can you hear me? In, the, in the harbor. And then the other thing you see to the right, another bonus when you're doing this, you're helping to equalize the whole, uh, the whole grid in Finland, in the Nordic country. So somehow you're doing something beneficial for the whole grid. The grid is becoming more and more all over the world. Is becoming, you know, the more we have renewables, the more the grid is, is oscillating. So when you create something like this, you help uh, load balance the grid and bring value to not only to the city, but to the national or international uh, network. I will not tell you in detail about all the studies to see where to place it. Uh, uh, you know, you saw it briefly before, the view from uh, uh, fr from the top. This kind of experience is a more as a learning center about energy, but also playful and fun one in, uh, inside uh, where all the, the, the heat is stored. Um, and again, starting from something that's, um, uh, you know, very, very important and uh, uh, in, in Finland about, you know, spending time with green and nature and the forest and trying to, to, to do that on the top of this kind of floating public spaces. Very briefly, just, you know, how to do the, um, the islands. Well, working with uh, SBP, Jörg Schleiss, uh, office in Germany, one of the most uh, exciting, you know, structure you can do in terms of, it's, uh, if you want to, you know, as a structural engineer, engineer, you would define it as a tensegrity structure, is very similar to a bicycle wheel. And if you're doing this, actually, you are using the spokes to avoid buckling, 
So, you know, it's very efficient from a, uh, from a, a structural engineering point of view. And then you can also do it easily by using the same pipelines that are used for, in general, for pipeline development. So it's, it's easy to build and effective in terms of, uh, of use of material. So just in a nutshell, you know, this can be completed by the, the end of the decade. Uh, all the energy for Helsinki, it's uh, 6,000 gigawatt hour, remember before? One megawatt hour, the main unit. You know, then you got one gigawatt hour and 6,000 and what you need to heat the whole, the whole city. All of that can be stored in the, uh, in the hot heart. One of the things we were very surprised at the beginning, we said, you know, when we enter the competition, we said, okay, we're going to produce decarbonized uh, energy for Helsinki, but people will have to pay more than they pay today. It turns out actually that when you do all the math, uh, the cost seems to be 10% less than today. So you're able to decarbonize, pay back the investment and get a lower cost for, uh, for the citizen. All the numbers, by the way, are changing because of the changing energy prices, but somehow they're getting even better in this case because uh, you know, what is changing is mostly gas, uh, oil, and, uh, and so on. Um, the two bonuses we mentioned before about you know, load balancing the Finnish grid and creating an attraction on the top of the, of the islands. And yes, you know, the investment is significant around a, a billion, but with a payback time that's quite, uh, quite short. So somehow, you know, that was one example I wanted to share with you. Again, uh, just to show for us was very interesting. The reason we entered the competition was we're quite excited about the city, not following, again, solutions from the past, but trying to use something similar to the X Prize in order to find uh, uh, new solutions. Now, in the remaining five minutes, I want to share with you another project as an example. Um, and that is also how we can innovate on the other side, not physically, but with, uh, with data. Today's our cities are becoming like a mix of digital and physical, like this. One way to say it is that the internet is becoming internet of things, is entering mixing with, uh, with the city, and that is producing a huge amount of data, sometimes real-time data. We can look for the first time at a city like this. We couldn't just a few years ago. By the way, this is Lisbon, mapped using billions of data points collected from uh, uh, the mobility network in the city. This visualization by Pedro Cruz from our lab at MIT was at MoMA, the Museum at, uh, of Modern Art in New York. Uh, but the key point is, uh, is how we can see a city like we couldn't just uh, a few years ago. And when you got data, you can discover interesting things. There's actually similar data in New York. Every dot is a pickup or a drop-off. By the way, which place is this? Any thoughts? JFK Airport. So that's, uh, if you landed in, in New York, you know, that's JFK. You see the different terminals. If you zoom out, you see JFK is down there. And you see Manhattan and, uh, and all of the boroughs. Incidentally, I'll tell you, uh, all this data was made accessible for research by Mike Bloomberg. Mike Bloomberg, when he was, Mike Bloomberg, when he was mayor of, uh, of New York. As you might know, Mike Bloomberg built a giant company, Bloomberg, based on data. And he was mayor, he was passionate about sharing data, about using data, about you know, somehow you know, using data to better understand cities. I remember in his office, in his office at City Hall, uh, he had a little sign that went, in God we trust, everybody else bring data. So data you know, was a core thing of what he tried to do as, uh, as mayor. And in this case, was the one to, to make the data accessible for, for research. So we started asking different questions with the data. The first question was, if you look at those two points in Manhattan, you got um, hundreds of thousands of trips connecting them in the course of the year. So how many trips could be shared by more than uh, one person? You know, and that's the old thing that happened, I think, to many of us in New York, in Barcelona, you're the at your hotel, you're going to the airport, you're there with a trolley in the morning. Next to you, there's somebody else with a trolley going exactly to the same destination. You could have shared the ride, but you simply didn't know that uh, that was the case. So we started this before Uber launched Uber Pool, so we wanted to quantify that. Um, sometimes when you got big data, you need big math or new mathematics. In this case, we use a, an approach based on network science simply because traditional approaches to analyze such large amount of data would fail. So we, we had to develop this new, uh, um, what we call it, share, shareability networks approach. You see them here. And, um, and what we discovered was uh, quite interesting. You see it up there in the upper left corner. And basically in New York, on the x-axis, you've got a small delay in arrival. So with a very small delay in arrival, one, two, or three minutes, that is in second, 
You could actually take everybody to destination, but with 40% less vehicle than, uh, than what we have today. And two interesting things happened. You know, the first thing, when this happened, uh, when this was published, it was a nice conversation in, uh, in the United States about the results. Uh, you know, with people uh, expressing interest about the idea of sharing more uh, mobility. Uh, there's a, there was also an, a review in the New York Times that was interesting because it said, you know, well, you know, the reporters say, you know, this is interesting mathematics, but, you know, New Yorkers really don't want to share anything. But it turns out that that is uh, not the case. Um, because uh, as part of the conversation at the time we were approached by Uber, uh, we started the first collaboration between MIT and Uber. And as you might know, today Uber Pool, or I think now they changed the name, Uber Share after the pandemic, but has become by Uber, by Lyft, uh, similar services by Uber, by Lyft, by Didi, by Ola, by all these kind of similar companies, have become one of the major industries globally about uh, sharing rights. So a multi million, multi billion dollar industry. By sharing rights. For us, it's interesting because again, it shows how you can look at the digital side of a city, you can analyze it, you can look at how the city could be reprogrammed. And, you know, well, in this case, if you got instead of two cars going from A to B and you combine it into a car, it means you turn that knowledge, the digital knowledge, into actions in the city, which means potentially one less car on the road, less energy consumption, less, cons less uh, pollution, and less uh, traffic in, uh, in our cities. So anyway, those are the two things I wanted to, to, to mention to you. And again, I believe cities, and a lot of you, you know, represent uh, you know, leading cities from, from Europe and beyond, should really look much more at how innovation happens, say, in VC, in innovation ecosystems, looking less about success stories from other cities from 10, 20, 30 years before, and looking more about how we can create a new uh, urban future. And I'll stop here, looking forward to continuing the conversation with all of you today. Thank you. Carlo Ratti, wow, fascinating Thank stuff you. there. Hopefully we can talk later and dig more into that data. Okay. Super interesting. Thank you so much for that. Lots of tips there as well for our mayors and deputy mayors and advisors there uh, in our room. And of course, this event is about you, about the mayors, about the deputy mayors and implementing the changes on the ground across the continent, across Europe. So now it's time to meet some of those mayors. And I'm very excited to invite some of you up here on stage with me to sit down and ask you a couple of questions. We've about 30 minutes on the clock to do so. So without further ado, I would like to invite the vice mayor of Amsterdam metropolitan area. That's Maria Raukrach. Hello, good afternoon, good to see you. <clears throat> you can take a seat just there, the second seat. Lovely. Thank you. I'd also like to invite up on stage Alexander van der Misne. That's the mayor of the city of Mechelen in Belgium, the Flemish city of Mechelen, not far from Brussels. Warm welcome to Barcelona. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being with us. You can sit there beside Maria. The third one? Se just beside Maria there, and I'll sit at the end. Here? No, here. Oh, here, here, yeah. Just here. Just here. Oh. Just here. And I'll sit over there. Because um, you, the mayors need to be very much in the centre stage here, because it's all about you. And joining us online today is the Vice Mayor of the City of Porto. That's Felipe Araujo. Good afternoon, Felipe. Can you hear us and see us? Thank you so much for joining us virtually. It's great to have you with us, and we're looking forward to hearing the inputs and the perspectives from the city of Porto in Portugal in just a minute. And I'd also like to invite up on stage uh, from Greece, the mayor of Farifula, that's Grigoris Konstantelos. <laughs> Great to have you up as well. And finally, from Croatia, the mayor of the city of Split, please invite up on stage with me, Rika Puljak. Hi, sir. Good to see you. Welcome. Good to here. Great, so thank you so much. It's lovely to see you all physically. Hello, you can take a seat here. And I'd like to kick off um, with our lady up here on the panel with Maria to get the perspective first from the Amsterdam metropolitan area and ask you a question about what exactly you're doing to build well-functioning partnerships across government departments, across businesses, knowledge stakeholders and local players in order to create joint actions. Because as we've heard today, this is all about working together and yeah. even Kyla Rathi pointed that out. Would you like to speak here from the podium? And I can sit then at the end. Oh, okay. Wherever you're comfortable. 
Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, well, it's all about collaboration. Uh, I've been here for two days now and every, everyone is uh, willing to work together. We have to have to, uh, uh, to go the, to this goal of uh, climate neutral cities in all of the world. So we need everyone. We need our inhabitants. We need our uh, entrepreneurs. We need our uh, municipalities and we have to work uh, together. And in the metropolitan area in, in Amsterdam, we do that uh, in, an, in a triple helix way. So we use um, the knowledge of the universities and, uh, and all the schools uh, that help us uh, with, uh, with their science and their knowledge. And we work with uh, our entrepreneurs in our, uh, in our region. We work together with uh, the municipalities and uh, the province and uh, also uh, the greater um, governance of, uh, of the, the Netherlands. And we do that in our um, so-called green deals. So we have uh, joint forces about special uh, subjects uh, in these green deals. So one of them is uh, about waste, uh, about textile, not throwing this nice dress away, but reusing it uh, again. And uh, we joined forces there. So that is one of the deals we have. And uh, another one is uh, about uh, smart logistic, uh, so city logistics uh, to, uh, to get zero emission, uh, to, uh, to get the, all the stuff we, we, uh, uh, we order on, uh, online uh, into the cities and uh, using hubs. Hubs is really in word uh, these days in smart mobility as well, because everyone is experimenting and trying out and that's the way how we have to do it, just do it and, and try on. And my favorite uh, green deal is uh, the green deal bike, because uh, in the Netherlands we are a biking uh, city, so uh, everyone is biking around and with this uh, electric bikes we can yeah, uh, in increase our distances between work and um, and our homes. So we um, we join forces also there with university and and businesses and uh, municipalities. And one of the things that is really getting into my heart is that um, not every little child learns to bike anymore because uh, parents do, do think that it's uh, dangerous and. And so uh, we have to really get there uh, as a new um, energy in it because it's really important that everyone learns to bike. Uh, so not many children here, but please get your children on the bike. And that is also one of the issues we, uh, we, we uh, perform in the Green Deal. So that's it. Fantastic. Okay. And what we heard this morning from the European Commission, from DG Quo Maria, is that the Commission is very much here to listen your ideas. So very concrete question. What can the EU do to support cities like yourself to implement the local Green Deal on the ground? Well, uh, the easy answer is uh, get the money uh, going. Oh, yeah. uh, that's uh, <laughs> really, uh, uh, you can uh, understand that uh, as a question, that as an answer. But uh, yesterday uh, we talked to uh, um, Patrick Kind. I suppose he is uh, from the European Commission. He was joining the European Forum uh, or the Smart City Forum yesterday. And we are, uh, yeah, we were also discussing to join forces there with knowledge and energy. And uh, he said, well, uh, the, the, the more concrete the plan is, the better you can uh, work together with the EU, EU. Okay, the more concrete the plan, okay. Maria, thank you so much. You can take your seat again. Thank you. A little bit later, yeah. A round of applause for Maria. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <coughs> absolutely adhere to what you say about bikes. I think they're absolutely <laughs> fantastic. They're my main mode of transport in Brussels. Um, hopefully you'll have a chance as well a little bit later to pose questions to Maria and the other panelists. We have about 25 minutes left, but now we can move on to the city of Mechelen. The Flemish city of Mechelen, you can take uh, the podium. Absolutely, go ahead. Alexander van der Missen. And my question to you is, the city of Mechelen, in case those um, in the room are not aware, have very ambitious targets, right, when it comes to climate neutrality. So how did you start this journey towards a green economy through the Flemish Green Deal? Well, in 2000, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 2018, we decided as, uh, as a small city, Mechelen, uh, 90,000 inhabitants, to look uh, a little bit to the north, to our uh, Dutch friends, because we also are a city that was 
expanding uh, in bicycle use. And there was a moment that it just couldn't expand anymore because we have, of course, as, as all of you here, a lot of cars in our city. And there was a, a moment that it just stopped. So we decided there's only one way ahead. And that's to invest heavily in bicycle infrastructure um, to catch up with our Dutch friends. In Belgium, it's not the same as in, in Holland. So we decided to invest uh, heavily 40 kilometers of uh, new bicycle roads in, in six years. We're midterm. And what we've seen is that um, it has exploded. The bicycle use uh, is really uh, quadrupled in Mechelen. It's crazy. Um, now we have the, the, the traffic uh, congestion with the cars and we also have the congestion with the bicycles. But the, the only way forward is investing more, make, creating more space, giving more space, of course, to, uh, to Mechelaars, to the inhabitants, but also to, to our bicycle users, users, because, of course, every trip by bike is uh, a trip by car um, less. And then the second important decision we made to, to, to get that uh, green shift, mobility-wise, is shared mobility. We uh, really decided to... Um, try and make the shift and for the first time in, in, in Belgium, in Flanders, we decided not to um, do it, um, as I say, normally uh, shared mobility follows the demand, but we did it the other way around. We said we're going to offer and uh, try and, and get two, in the short term, two shared mobility cars per uh, thousand inhabitants. After three years, uh, we are there. The Flemish government uh, last week uh, gave us a prize together with Ghent and, uh, and Leuven for the uh, big step we already took. Now the ambition is uh, to 2030 to get to 1,000 shared cars. Now it's 209, but uh, against 2030 to 1,000 shared uh, cars in Mechelen. And that would be uh, in Belgium a uh, unique, unique number. So we think with those two things, mobility-wise, we can make um, an important green shift um, to a sustainable society and economy in Mechelen. And to get to that path, what are the main challenges that you're experiencing now when it comes to achieving the twin transition in, I guess, a perma-crisis world? And how can cities help industries and businesses transition towards this circular economy and promote it? The, for small cities as Mechelen, we have 90,000 inhabitants. It's clear that uh, we cannot do this alone. And when you, when you have the, the possibility to develop green uh, um, uh, warm, warm nets, warmed nets uh, in, uh, in new developments, that's difficult because it's, it costs a lot of money. So it's been said, uh, Europe could help, but that's not realistic to, to ask from uh, Flemish government or the European uh, institutions to pay for these investments. So we have to look to the private sector. And we have to create opportunities, try to make connection, because it's very complicated, it's very difficult. You have to, to follow uh, a long traje trajectory. Uh, you get the licenses, you have to, it's technically not, not really uh, always uh, viable. So we have to do that as a city, we have to take that responsibility, bring organizations together, universities, and try to get uh, as, as uh, concrete as possible, uh, to get the, the, the opportunities as concrete as possible, and then it's possible to, to get uh, realizations on the terrain and uh, move forward. But it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy, I can tell by the look on your face. Alexander <laughs> van der Missen, the mayor of the city of Mechelen, you can take a seat. Thank you so much for Thank that. And from Mechelen, now we can bring in the perspective from Porto, the Portuguese uh, city, and hear from Felipe, the vice mayor there. Good afternoon, Felipe. I hope you can hear us and see us well. Um, first question, how can cities like yourself address the current crisis, this perma crisis that we're, we're facing, the war in Ukraine, soaring energy prices, shortages in the food system, questions that all the locals there, I'm sure, are looking at you for answers. Oh. 
That's no sound. Okay. Can you? We can't hear Felipe. We can't hear you. Maybe it's mute. In teams. Yep. <laughs> so while we fix those technical <laughs> technical difficulties, <laughs> we can bring in the perspective from Fadi Fula. Um, and here from Grigoris. Grigoris, we met last year in Brussels. Yes, we did. Good to see you again. The world has changed since we've seen each other. Definitely. You're adapting to the times. And how is your city, Farifula, addressing those challenges of high energy prices? We saw just last week people in Greece taking to the streets, protesting against the impact they're having on, on people locally. Uh, first of all, I think protesting is within our blood down here, <laughs> because there's nothing to worry about. Uh, uh, definitely, the, 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 the crisis the, is there. It's not something that we, we expected, we anticipated, uh, and we tackled with uh, efficient ways. So, uh, the, the question is how we can deal with this, this uh, uh, crisis, the, the fuel crisis, the, the econ economics that comes along. Unfortunately, cities cannot tackle this problem. What we can do, we can reduce the consumptions or we, we can transform our cities to, to power productors. Uh, this is what we do. This is what we do in Variable Many, We, uh, back in 2015, we sat down and, uh, and, and we, we managed with, with uh, the Polytechnical School of Athens a very thorough uh, local green deal. And this roadmap has been followed to the last detail till now. Uh, I think sustainability has to, 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 to do with, with, with people, with economy and with environment. So all those three things, we try to, to put them in, in, in the same, in the same uh, format and to design what the city will be for the next 10 years. What we have achieved after eight years, we have an energy reduction of 54%. We used uh, and we're using uh, LED lighting in street lighting and in, uh, in all sports centers, in uh, uh, schools. We are uh, transformed all buildings, local buildings, uh, city buildings and uh, athletic uh, sport facilities with photovoltaic panels as producers of energy. We are uh, using technologies that has to do with, uh, with uh, uh, heat pumps for heating and cooling. We are even addressing the issue with geothermy. So all those things have managed to reduce by 54%, but we're continuing and this thing will uh, uh, evolve to a 75% reduction with reference years 2013. Within 10 years, we will be very close to the uh, neutrality, to climate neutrality percentages. And this is what we do for that sector, which is the energy sector. We have the waste, we have the, the smart mobility, things that has to be addressed and are being addressed in a very thorough and systematic way that has to convince the city inhabitants to be part of this. If the city inhabitants will not be part of this, of this it will be waste of time and waste of money. And, you know, energy things, climate things, urban neutrality should not be a fashion should be a theory, a concrete theory that will be uh, addressed and adopted by city administration and the people that the users, our customers, which are the inhabitants of the cities. Absolutely. That's something that Carlo Ratti gave in his um, speech as well. He said, try an idea, test it on the locals. If they don't like it, then, then scrap it. Of course, you absolutely need the locals on board. And you're sitting here with your counterparts from, from Croatia, from Belgium and from the Netherlands. So my question is, how can collaboration between European cities and, of course, everyone else in the room and Porto online, how can it help you drive and reach these goals when it comes to these challenges that you mentioned? You know, be innovative or productive is not a very easy thing. You will lose money, you will spend time, you will have successes and failures. So what we have to do is we have to share this knowledge. The success of Varibula Vuljagmeni can be success of Split of Amsterdam and vice versa. We're going to save time and money. And then we'll go to the Commission and we will not have just have another pilot project because we have tens of thousands of, of, of pilot projects. Then we will go there, as we said last year to the Commissioner, you, will be, you were there, to finance the majority, if possible, of those pilot 
projects, successful pilot projects are in the in the buckets, in, in, in the in the closets of all municipalities throughout Europe. Someone has to go there and finance them. Uh, so by sharing the knowledge, by forcing or pushing the Commission to put in reality a lot of resources there or to assist us to leverage Philippe, can you hear me? this is also another way of financing you're green projects. You're... We have plans, we have the willingness to do it and we need the means. So we have to provide the means in, in, in terms of, of know-how know first and funds uh, from state or European uh, uh, sources. Okay. Grigoris Konstantelos, thank you so much for giving us the thank perspective much, there from Sari Fula, from Greece. <laughs> now, if I get a nod from the back of the room, we can head again over to Porto and bring in the Vice Mayor of Porto. Can you hear us? Porto, no? Can you hear us? <laughs> Felipe? No? Okay, we'll try to get Felipe in just a minute and now we'll get the perspective from Split. And Mr. Puljak is here with us in the room. Great to see you, thank you so much. Um, first question to yourself. <laughs> How does the city of Split pursue its agenda on decarbonisation of buildings and mobility? <laughs> Hello, thank you first uh, for inviting me here. And uh, I'm a freshly elected mayor and I ca came here with a great enthusiasm. Uh, to learn from the best practices of others and try to predict the future. And then Professor Ratti came and told me that this yeah. is not working <laughs> at all. <laughs> so now I have to, to reformat my enthusiasm. <laughs> but this is a joke. And I'm also a scientist. <laughs> so, uh, so in Split, actually, uh, what we are doing uh, to pursue our agenda of decarbonization, we are building the Green City Action Plan and Policy Dialogue with e EBRD Bank, which is ex actually something that, that you here as an as a intelligent city challenge is also, also doing. And uh, uh, in, in this intelligent uh, city challenge, uh, we have actually uh, developed several ideas. Uh, one of them is, uh, Split is the town on the south of Croatia, it's the second largest city in Croatia. It has more than 300 uh, sunny days a year. So we want actually what, what we started, and now it turns out that this is a, re a really gr a great idea, particularly because of energy crisis these days. We actually developed the uh, 3D model of this entire city, and then developed the, the solar potential so that every citizen can see the uh, solar potential of its roof and can calculate what is the potential. And now we are upgrading this system that they can calculate, uh, uh, does it pay off to install the photovoltaics on their roofs and uh, even to look for the companies to install and help them and to pro provide them installation services and uh, solar panel distributors, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So this is one of the ideas that we are developing now and I think it, we will have them ready in a few months from now. Then an another thing is about bikes and everything is about bikes as I see everybody likes bikes. <coughs> but Split is the town with many hills, uh, ups and downs. And 10 years ago, if somebody would tell you that even, uh, even propose to install the public bike system, everybody would laugh. And, uh, but what happened that when we did, yeah, just, just it, just... it turns out to be so, so uh, uh, popular that we have, have now more uh, bike rentals than all the cities in Croatia together, <laughs> which is really, really successful, uh, successful uh, idea. And now, of course, we, we are trying to develop all these, uh, these ideas about, uh, uh, about modernization of city lightning, uh, uh, improvement of our public transport, etc., etc. And uh, I think that uh, by sharing our experiences here, even, even though if the, we, are not, uh, we are not supposed to look at the best practices, but I think that, uh, th that we, we can get, uh, uh, get uh, uh, ideas and share experiences uh, between us and that will help us to, to reach our agenda. And on that note, actually, on advice and tips, do you have any advice from the City of Split for cities to engage their local ecosystems in activities to decarbonise buildings and mobility? Well, I do, and this is, uh, this is uh, uh, I think, the usual advice. 
I'm a politician, actually. But actually, I'm, I'm a professor of physics at university. Then I turn, out, turn to politician because I, I've been elected as a mayor one year ago. And then I resigned. And then I went for the next elections. <laughs> and, and actually, uh, we, we are a very small party. And we won against the biggest party in Croatia. And then when, when I was analyzing why it happened, it happened because somehow we got citizens on our side. And that's, that's the crucial point, to get citizens on your side. The good news for all of us is that the citizens are already on this side. We just last week, we, we made a pool about uh, waste management. We want to improve our waste management system in, in Split. We made a pool among citizens. And it turns out, it turns out that 80% of them said that they are already sorting the waste. And which is not true. They are not doing it. Not 80% of them, <laughs> but maybe not even more than 50%. But they actually wanted to make, uh, uh, to appear more positive in the answers than they are really are. But the more positive means it's exactly our side. So the citizens are prepared for that already. And we just have to, to engage them and to, to offer them infrastructures and the ideas. And I think that we will succeed in that. Perfect. Mr. Pojak, thank you so much. Super interesting to hear there the perspective from Split. And a bit of information for us all that you're a physicist turned politician. You can tell <laughs> us later which is easier. <laughs> but now I believe we do have Felipe over in Porto. Thank you so much, Felipe, for your patience and excuse me for those technical glitches. So the question that we wanted to address to you was how are you dealing with the current multiple crises facing the continent of Europe and, of course, your city yourself? How are you keeping people happy and on board? Thanks. Well, first of all, are you hearing? Yes. Perfectly, yes? yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Right into it. good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you, although it's remote, but that's definitely what the digital has shown us in the past years, that it's still possible to participate, although we cannot be present uh, in some of the events due to the agendas that we have. Well, um, it's a, first of all, let me just say that it's, uh, it's fabulous to be integrated in the Intelligent Cities Challenge, the ICC, and uh, it's been quite a, a surprise for us. It's uh, been very rich also to learn from other cities, to be aware of the difficulties that, uh, that we have encountered in this project, also in the ICC network, and to, to foster new connections and to, to create, even in Portuguese cities, which uh, the ICC has also promoted, and develop joint work between us. And going concretely to your to your uh, to your question, uh, I would say that uh, especially uh, now due to all the crisis, and I've, I heard some of the, the other panels, uh, the colleagues from other cities. And definitely, we have to be very strategic in terms of what the times that we are addressing since the pandemic and now the, the war in Ukraine and the invasion that we had, we assisted in Europe that we were not even thinking about it was possible some time ago. And we have to be very, uh, in terms of long-term goals that we, we have and we share, uh, the carbon neutrality and many others. And it's cities that are uh, addressed to, 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 to cope with this challenge, to have the right solutions and at least to lead uh, the citizens to explain how, 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 how things can be done and to lead the way, as we usually as we say. And, and especially now, what I've seen and uh, to address or, or to add something to all the other interventions that I heard before, I would say that we are in a moment that we, uh, due to all the, the crisis, we can go to some of the uh, things that we were doing and try to see if we can be even more efficient, if we can address that in a different way. And specifically, when we talk about energy, sometimes we give things for granted. And I will give you just an example about, for example, public lightning. What, what, what we have done, we, we studied about what could be the small changes in terms of the time that the, the light is on. And we discovered that we could cut some minutes in the beginning and in the end. Uh, and for that, we, we, we reduced more than 1,000 megawatts of energy per year. We wouldn't do that if uh, there wasn't uh, a crisis as we, uh, we are seeing right now. We would change it to LED, of course, but we will never go deep into the subject and to change even to a higher standard or be more efficient. 
And this is a small example, but that, that you can use in many other uh, things that uh, the crisis have uh, put us to think, that has put all our teams to think and to devise new solutions. When you come to the pandemic and you see, for example, the food, uh, the farm to fork uh, that is also in the Green Deal, we have all tried in our cities to put the producers in contact with the citizens. So we have come a long way. I think it's uh, during these times that we, we developed uh, Europe, that we evolved a lot. And of course, as I've uh, heard before, we have to keep the citizens with us. And uh, for that, just to give you a small example also, we launched the Porto Climate Pact in the beginning of this year. And Porto Climate Pact is, uh, is a way of formalizing the, the ambition that we have on climate neutrality uh, in 2030, but also to be an engine and uh, to mobilize all the local actors, all the citizens, all the public and, and the private organizations um, towards these goals. So we have all, the, uh, especially now during this time, to put the, the goals and the planning and the long-term goals also uh, in, uh, in all the citizens' mind, uh, because it's the only way to achieve this in Europe is to do it together. And just briefly, do you think every city should have a local Green Deal? I think that definitely every city has a, a role uh, towards the, the green European Green Deal. And uh, in the local level, as, as I mentioned before, is where we will see the biggest changes. So I think all should try to figure out how we can work on climate ambition or, or how we can work in clean, affordable, and also secure energy as we, we have right now, but also on farm to fork that I mentioned, clean and circular economy. So there is a lot that the Green Deal in, uh, has uh, in, the, in their biggest strategy that at the local level, we are uh, the ones responsible to solve it. So uh, again, the cities should lead, lead by example, and local Green Deals are a, a good way to formalize it and to involve the, the citizens uh, towards these goals. Okay, thank you so much. I would like to ask all of you that same question. Brief, quick question, so just a quick answer as well. Should every city have a Green Deal? We start with the city of Mechelen. What do you think, Alexander? Well, <coughs> in, uh, in Flanders, the Flemish government already uh, tried to, to get all the cities in um, a local Green Deal. Um, and we have 300 cities and now 293, I think signed already the local green deal so it's it's uh, pretty ambitious um, on the mobility side also uh, uh, green energy um, the flemish government is really pushing cities uh, ahead and it's good because it, it, it creates a dynamic uh, between cities who want to go uh, and, and lead by example and the flemish government who also wants uh, to, to reach their ambitions so um, i can only say in flanders we already are going uh, going quite strong <coughs> oh <laughs> are you okay yeah well i'm not uh, really fond of obligatory uh, things so but i think that every city should want to have a green deal because it helps them to make things concrete and and to join every party together uh, to, <coughs> to get the commitment and the collaboration uh, with everyone Okay, so every city should have one. <laughs> Yourself? Yeah. <coughs> I, I think that, that the, the plan should be there, but the plan should be there to be followed, because it's, this is another chapter. Because in the world of, of managing cities, and generally in, in the political world, we, we design a lot of plans and we <laughs> let them for the next voting period, yeah. which is not very, very productive. So what we do is we have to, to put handcuffs to ourselves to towards those green uh, local deals and what you can do it with many ways for example in our city what we do is no uh, work public work no service bought or product bought cannot be performed if does not has a reference on the local green deal nothing happens if it's not obeying this uh, truck this, this truck is is the truck for, for for tomorrow for our children and our grandchildren and we have to respect it. Okay. 
And Mr. Uh, yes, I think that uh, every <coughs> city should, should have it, and this is, it is going in actually in that direction, because I think that our governments and European Union and everybody is, is pushing in that direction, and now many cities are uh, willing to do it, and some of them are already doing, doing it. For example, in Croatia, whenever you want to, to write a strategic document, you have to, to pass some certain requirements for the in environmental protection, etc. And I think that through these, actually, these green deals are being set up. Okay. <coughs> thank you so much there, Mr. Project, and thank you so much to all our mayors and to the Deputy Mayor of Porto, who joined us there remotely. So now it's time for a coffee break. We've asked him that question. Yep. Now it's time for your coffee break or a tea and honey break for myself. <laughs> um, we haven't had time for questions, I'm afraid, unless there's a burning comment or remark from the room, because <coughs> we've already eaten into the coffee break for five minutes. So <coughs> I reckon we go for the coffee break. And if you have questions for the mayors, they'll be there as well having coffee. And we meet back then in 15 minutes for the round tables. So a round of applause to all our mayors and to our Deputy Mayor of Porto online. <laughs>
but uh, let's see what cities did in our focus areas. 42 cities are already in their way to launch a local green deal aiming at improving productivity for businesses by following a path of green and sustainable growth. Also, 23 cities have been selected to participate into the 100 cities mission. The roadmaps support a portfolio of activities, including monitoring of energy consumptions in buildings, investments in green infrastructures, investments on greening the energy, smart utility management, monitoring environmental footprint and air quality, and raising awareness among their citizens and businesses. In the focus area of, of citizens' participation and digitization uh, of public administration, cities developed infrastructures and services to create growth opportunities for local businesses and startups. In total, 115 solutions were developed and 22 digital initiatives were launched to respond to the COVID pandemic. Their initiatives include investments on digital solutions for improving local services, open data platforms, digital infrastructure, infrastructures for 5G and Internet of Things, digital solutions for security, engaging citizens, citizens and businesses via digital participatory mechanism, digital solutions for improving accessibility and inclusions, and solutions for improving the administration of cities. Upskilling and reskilling, green and digital uh, transition in tourism and supply chains. These logistics and the economy of mobility, these are also three areas that uh, several cities uh, investigate. Cities focus on supply chains, logistics, and the economy of mobility uh, in order to spark cities' competitiveness, economic growth, and job creation. In this area, 46 solutions were developed, including green mobility applications and the development of multimodal mobility platforms. Cities with tourism industry focus on green and digital transitions and tourism and use smart and sustainable practices to boost growth opportunities. 29 solutions were developed, including digital tourism infrastructures and alternative tourism models. Finally, cities use innovative education and training approaches for upskilling and reskilling their workforce. 35 cities have signed uh, the Pact for Skills and other skills initiatives. Uh, and 26 solutions were developed, including online and offline centers for upskilling and promotion of upskilling and reskilling programs. Uh, the cities, in order to implement their roadmaps, earmarked 1.9 billion euro. Although ICD did not provide any funding, it helps cities to leverage around a quarter of a billion of additional funding from EU, national, and regional uh, sources. Is ICC helped in various ways for improving the better documenting and city strategies to opening up opportunities for cities to participate in city networks, opening up opportunities for successful participation in European and uh, national initiatives. But uh, to achieve their goals, cities are not alone, the city administrations. They relied on the development of local and EU-level ecosystems and the mobilization of their stakeholders. 682 companies and other private entities were engaged in the development of city solutions, and more than half of the solutions engaged SMEs, large companies, and startups. And almost all the participation cities reached out and engaged uh, their citizens. Finally, 233 collaborations were cultivated between cities within and outside the ICC network. OK. 
Okay, sorry. So in my last slide, I would like to give you an overview of the next steps. Uh, with this conference, we close the first phase of the ICC. Next month, in December, we open up the planning phase of the next phase of the ICC. And your deliberations today and the meeting with uh, uh, the city teams tomorrow are significant sources for inspirations for the design of the new ICC. And in February next year, we launch the next ICC phase and open the selection of new city entrants. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Nikos Marulis there, the ICC project director from Technopolis. And in case you missed any of the information there, we will, of course, share that with you after the event so you can take a closer look. But now I would like to invite up once more on stage Valentina Superti from the European Commission from DG Grow. She will make some brief closing remarks and then you'll all be invited up here for the family photo. After the family photo, there'll be a ne networking opportunity out there in the hall. And then later on tonight at around eight o'clock, those elected officials in the room should have got an invitation to a dinner hosted by the city of Barcelona. If you haven't got the information on the dinner, don't you worry, you can ask at the info desk. But now I'll hand over to uh, Valentina. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, actually, thank you for, uh, for uh, this first uh, long afternoon and um, with the intelli Intelligent uh, Cities uh, Challenge um, uh, project. I hope, first of all, that you enjoyed it. So I hope that you had a little bit of fun uh, today uh, in being with us and being uh, between yourselves and the discussions uh, were uh, also fun for you. Uh, I also hope it was not only fun, but that you also find some value in the, both in the presentations and in the many uh, exchanges and um, discussions uh, that you had. My, I have a number of uh, takeaways, actually. It was not all the time with you, but uh, still, I thought um, that uh, um, all in all, it's, uh, we count on you, <laughs> because it's cities who appear to be uh, uh, really at the front, uh, forefront of, uh, of innovation and uh, laboratories and uh, engines for change and transformation. I've heard a lot of interesting uh, uh, projects uh, today. And uh, not only, so this is my first takeaway, but the second takeaway um, is that not only you are, uh, you are an engine of innovation, but you are also determined to be an engine of innovation. So you have seen uh, quite um, a willingness uh, uh, to, to make uh, all those uh, uh, required changes happen. So, um, and then thirdly, Actually, and this is something that amazes me each time, actually, I have to say, because, you know, we, we work in the European Commission, and I've always, uh, you know, this fear that we are a little bit far away from reality, that it's difficult to connect. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I also today, I, I note a, a full convergence of objectives. And, um, and this is very reassuring for me. I hope it's reassuring for you because I can tell you that uh, your projects, as I, as I have uh, um, witnessed them today, uh, for me are uh, uh, fully in line with the uh, policy objective and political objectives of the, of the European Commission. So with that in mind, I, I think I, I would just invite you to continue uh, to engage with us, but not only with us, to engage between yourselves, uh, to exchange uh, good practices, but then at some point in time also close the loop and come to us so that we can uh, all make the best uh, out of uh, it. Uh, I would stop here because I, I think uh, you all uh, want some coffee now or some, you know, some rest, uh, some, some um, freedom. And in any event, I, I, we, I'm keen to have the further discussion tomorrow with, uh, I think it's more technical, uh, uh, with more technical uh, uh, 
uh, more technical discussions, but I very welcome uh, those as well. And uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, let's enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Some excellent, excellent advice there from Valentina. Let's enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much. And also, as Laia Bonnet, the Deputy Mayor of Barcelona, t said this morning, she said, you have to enjoy the city. So I hope you also have some time to do that. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Valentina. And thank you to all those who spoke up on stage today. And of course, to you as well, the audience, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much for your attention. As I said, now there will be a family photo. So if you'd like to all come along up here. I think that's all the announcements from me. And we'll meet again tomorrow at nine in the morning. So enjoy the rest of the evening. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>